Welcome once again, and this is a special session. I promised you last session that I am going to bring you a special, special teaching about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. You know, it's kind of a hot topic in some Christian circles today. We just came from reading the first part of Acts chapter 2. This is when the apostles were in the upper room and all kinds of people from all kinds of different countries were there. And normally, you know, in context, if you read it in context and just reading between the lines, so to speak, normally these people would come, you know, every Passover, every Pesach, come to Jerusalem to celebrate the the Passover. Well, somehow they ended up in the upper room with the apostles this time. Here are the 12 apostles, all Jewish men. And they're in this room and there's 120 of them. And the Spirit of God comes And it says that a lot of signs and wonders happened. The sound of a great rushing mighty wind, you know, fire appeared. You know, these apostles that never spoke other languages before started speaking the languages of the other other people that were there from other countries. And they were amazed. I mean, these, they knew the apostles didn't know these languages, okay? But these, the apostles were speaking languages they didn't learn. God really just took control of them. God took control of their mouth, so to speak, and they spoke, as it says, the wondrous works of God. You know, like I said in the last session, I'm wondering what they said. Wouldn't you like to know what they said? That would be an awesome thing to know. You know, one day we might find out. But this is a very special teaching. I'm not going to read through scripture like I usually do. I want to have a heart-to-heart talk with you. I think this is a very important topic. I'm going to start off by telling you my own personal story, okay? Let's start off with my own story. How did I get from where I was to where I am today? In regards only, okay? I mean, only in regards to speaking in tongues and believing what I believe about it today. See, I grew up in a home that wasn't a church-going home. We, uh, the home in general, we were a believing home. You know, we considered ourselves to be a Christian home. Uh, And I spent a lot of time with my grandmother as a young boy, okay? And so she would tell me a lot of stories. And one story she would tell me over and over again, and that was a church that she knew of very well. Like she didn't attend it regularly, but she knew of it very well. Well, she knew the preacher. Actually, she was related to the preacher. She was actually kind of close friends with the, with the preacher as well as a family member in a, you know, not a very immediate family member, but a family member with the preacher. Okay. But she would tell me of some of the amazing things that would happen in this church. And she would say that people would just roll on the floor swinging from the chandeliers, crawling up the walls, and speaking in tongues. And no, you know, when I was a young boy and I heard these stories, and she would tell me, you know, from time to time, you know, I I mean, like not every day, but, you know, maybe once a year or so, maybe a couple times a year, she would tell me the story of this church. And when I heard it, I really didn't know what to think. It was kind of like way over my head. You know, I I just like, wow, you know, <laughs> rolling on the floor, crawling up the walls, and swinging from the chandeliers. Wow, Grandma, you got quite a story. And that's, you know, like, wow, that happened? And she's like, yeah, yeah. They, and they were speaking in tongues. And she was trying to explain to me what they were doing. Well, you know, when I was 18 years old, God got a hold of me and... Uh, brought me into the fold very close and it was a wonderful thing you know hallelujah hallelujah for that okay and so I attended different churches and one of the churches that I attended well, actually I did attend a church a couple churches that was very um, Pentecostal okay one was Pentecostal but not too pushy on it like every Sunday there would be one or two people usually the same people that would be you know, standing up or, you know, during worship, they would just be hollering out all this 
sounded like just uh, mumbo jumbo gibberish, you know. It was purported to be speaking in tongues and there would be another person after the uh, explosion of public tongue talking, there was somebody else that would just explode in this English so-called interpretation. And, uh, you know, honestly, when I was going there, none of it seemed to be very, uh, apart from the first time that I went there, the first time that I went there, always when you go to a place like that, the first time it's like, wow, what's going on? But uh, after that, it was always is pretty much kind of the same kind of thing, you know. Uh, the mess, the message in tongues would always sound very similar, and the uh, the interpretation would be always on the similar tone. Then I went from there to another church that was very, uh, very pushy when it came to speaking in tongues. It's like they taught that if you didn't speak in tongues, you didn't have it. Like you, if you didn't speak in tongues, you didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's basically what they said. That's basically how they portrayed it. If you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit and you need to get it. And, uh, and so they basically, by action, not so much by word, but by action, taught that everybody needs to speak in tongues. You need to seek this. You need to, you need to speak in tongues. And once you do, you got it, right? And so what they would do is they would they would frequently have these services where they would call people forward and they would say, who wants to receive the Holy Spirit? And they, they would lay hands on everybody and, and, and they would encourage people, you know, start with one syllable, ba, ba, be, ba, ba, be, ba, and, and then go to two syllables, ba, ba, ka, ka, sha, ba, ta, na, and then, go, and then just go like that. And then they would Basically, say you go from one syllable to two syllables, and then you know, by the end of the night, you might be you might be uh, doing like a ba sha ma ta ka ta na ta, like that kind of thing. And then you're supposed to go home, and you're supposed to practice it. Okay, you're supposed to practice it. And they say, well, you know, you just got to practice it, and you'll get fluent in your heavenly language. Okay. So uh, I want. Just, just as a little bonus here, I went from that church to another church that was more like um, charismatic. They focused on the gifts of the Spirit quite heavily, but not so much the gift of speaking in tongues. That was kind of a relief because they basically taught that, yeah, you can have the Spirit of God and you can be you know, moved by the Spirit of God without actually having the gift of tongues. And that is actually more biblical. You know, it makes it very clear. Paul makes it very clear in his teachings. You know, not everybody is an eye. Not everybody has the vision to see in the spirit. Not everybody is a tongue, okay? Not everybody is supposed to preach, okay? Not everybody is a hand. Not everybody is a foot, okay? Everybody is a different part of the body of Messiah, okay? I think that's a little bit more uh, biblical, a little bit more acceptable. I started realizing in this charismatic church that they treated the gift of prophecy just like how the other church treated the gift of tongues, where it's like if you don't prophesy, you don't have the Spirit of God and you need to prophesy. Well, again, that's a little bit more biblical because you see Paul teaches that uh, you need to pursue the gift of prophecy, okay? So um, that's the thing, okay? So I started really really meditating a lot about all these kind of churches and how they taught and the different gifts of the Spirit. You see, another thing in this church that taught a lot about prophecy and, you know, how to hear from, you know, the Lord and all this kind of stuff, you know, they would they would be teaching people, you know, they would have classes, prophetic classes, like, you want to be a prophet? Come and, come and join our class. We'll teach you how to hear from God, and you'll be hearing from God in no time, okay? And you'll be prophesying in no time. And it would be just like, almost like the other church with tongues. It'd be like, turn the gift on whenever you wanted to, and turn the gift off whenever you wanted to. You control your tongues, you control your prophecy. And so, after I came out from that, I started getting into the scriptures more, then I started realizing that a lot of the teachings about tongues and about prophecy wasn't in the Bible at all. Where do the apostles call people forward and teach them to say bakashana? Okay? Where in the in the in the scriptures do the apostles call people forward and tell them, you just got to practice your tongue. You just got to, you know, where in the scriptures do does anybody teach anybody else about any kind of gift of the Spirit of God? 
Acts chapter 2, they didn't even know what was coming. Same with other parts of the book of Acts when people started speaking in other languages, tongues, okay? Speaking in tongues. Nobody taught them to do that. And for the most part, they never expected that. They didn't even know about that, okay? And, and the same goes for prophecy, by the way, too. And I have to make another whole teaching about that, you know. And I, I once heard a pastor say, well, yeah, Eli taught uh, Samuel how to prophesy. It's like, wait a second. I looked it up in the scriptures. It's like, Eli was a priest, not a prophet. He did not know how to hear from God himself. When God wanted to speak to him, God sent a prophet to Eli to speak to him. Eli didn't know the voice of God. It was just that Eli was in the temple. Samuel lived in the temple. And Samuel heard this voice calling him, you know, time and time and time again. Well, Samuel's sleeping right there before the Ark of the Covenant, okay? The seat of God on earth, where the glory of God is, okay? Eli's somewhere else. And time and time and time again, he comes to Eli thinking that Eli called his name. Eli's like, no, it wasn't me. Go back to sleep. Goes back, calls, Eli's like, no, it wasn't me this time. Finally, Eli clued in and said, wait a second. He's sleeping right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. The glory of God is there. The presence of God is there. No one else is in the temple. Who else would it be but the Lord? Eli didn't give prophetic courses to Samuel. It was a sovereign gift of God, not an acquired skill taught by men. Okay? It was a sovereign gift of of God and not an acquired skill taught by man. This is what it's all about when it comes to speaking in other tongues. Is the gift of tongues in operation today as it was in the book of Acts? Yeah, it is. It actually is. But 99.99% of the people who are speaking in tongues, supposed to be speaking in tongues, is really only speaking in a fabricated tongue, okay? Fabricated fake gift of the Spirit. Not a sovereign gift of God. It's something that they've actually learned how to do from somebody else. So it's something that they've been pushed to do, okay? There's a guy that I know of, okay? Doesn't live too, too far from me. An old guy. While he was at church, it was in one of these meetings where, you know, you really feel the presence of God really strong. A, a very charismatic thing going on. And he felt the Spirit of God come over him in a very, very powerful way. And he felt the Spirit of God just, just make him shout these, these syllables like, hi all these kinds of things. And he starts, he starts shouting these kind of syllables, just these kind of symbol, syllables like this, okay? And the guy beside him, who was from Japan, said, hey, I didn't know you spoke Japanese. And the old guy says, I don't speak Japanese. He's the other guy, and the Japanese guy said, "You just did speak Japanese." And the guy said, "Well, what did I say? Like, did I speak Japanese? Really? I mean, I just felt the spirit of God come on me." And the guy said, "Yeah, you did speak Japanese." He said, "What did you say?" He said, "You kept on saying over and over again, Jesus is number one. Jesus is number one. Jesus is number one." And you said that in Japanese. And you see, back in those days, it was a big thing in Japan at that time where it was like, this is number one, that's number one, you know, so-and-so is number one, you know, number one, number one in Japan, right? Well, God just happened to move this guy, supernaturally give him a language that he's never learned before to say Jesus is number one, okay? So you hear of testimonies like that, and I guarantee you there are legitimate and genuine testimonies of those who are speaking in tongues. But I can also guarantee you that most, most, by far, most of the people that you hear speaking like that, and they say they're speaking in tongues, it's not the real, genuine gift of tongues. It is a counterfeit. It is a it's something that they have taught themselves how to babble like a, like a child. You know, children today, you know, toddlers, you know, they, they, they say these different syllables, all kinds of stuff. Like, hey, you know, you can teach yourself, yes, to babble once again. So the purpose here is this. Let's remove all fakeness from the church. Let's get all hypocrisy out and let's get all the fake stuff out. 
Let's get all the fake tongues out. Let's get all the fake prophecy out. Okay? Let's have the real deal. Let's have services. Let's have meetings. Let's have a community. The real deal community. Let's have the book of Acts kind of church. So some of you might say, hey, so how do I know if I've got it Real, the real one or the fake one? Well, I mean, how did you get it in the first place? I mean, really, you got to look right back to the source. How did you get it? It's easy to claim that you have some kind of gift of God. I mean, it's a, it's a pride thing. I mean, it just makes you feel so good about yourself. Hey, I got a gift from God, you know. But hey, let's be real. Let's be humble, okay? Do you really, okay? If you really, it won't be just chatter, it won't be just chatter, okay? As Paul said, the gift of tongues is to be interpreted into a meaningful thing for people. So this is where it's all at. It's got to be something that you understand or someone else understands, okay? If you don't understand it, and if somebody else doesn't understand it, what I mean by understand, I mean interpret it at least somehow. If you don't know what it means, then what use is it? Really? Really, what use is it? And then there's the topic of how to discern true interpretation from fake interpretation. Really what it all comes down to is this. I'll make it very simple for you. Interpretation is like prophecy. Any prophet that prophesies any considerable amount of time without calling people to repentance is a false prophet. Any prophet that does not define, identify, and eradicate sin is a false prophet. False, I said, yes, false. In the same way, if you hear tongues upon tongues and interpretation upon interpretation, it's all the same kind of thing, just, you know, kind of, you know, just bless my socks off kind of stuff all the time. Well, the Lord wants to bless you. The Lord wants to bless you. Oh, the Lord loves you. Oh, the Lord this. Oh, it's always this positive thing. You know, you know what I've heard from somebody before? And this is really shook me and it should shake you too. It was a prophet, a so-called prophet, and he was teaching other people how to prophesy. Again, you can't really teach people how to prophesy. That's not scriptural whatsoever. It's either God gives you the gift of prophecy or not. It's either your mouth or not. You know, not everybody's a mouth, not everybody's an eye. But this, this guy said, well, if you're not sure, if you want to prophesy over somebody and you're not sure what the Lord's saying, if you're not sure of, of what you hear is God's voice, then just speak positive words over this, this person. Just bless the, that person. Just say, well, the Lord says he's going to bless you. Well, the Lord says he's going to multiply you. Well, the Lord says he's going to give you a raise. Well, the Lord, I mean, all this stuff. That is very sad. And at the same time, that should make you very angry because that is, that's just wrong. How many prophets? I mean, Paul said that true prophecy, when a sinner comes into the meaning of the true prophets, those prophets will expose the secret sins of that sinner and that sinner will fall down and repent and say, truly God is among you. Okay? And that goes for interpreting tongues as well. If you get Sunday after Sunday of interpretation of tongues, or if you get meeting after meeting of, of tongues and interpretation, and none of that interpretation is sounds really, really, really Bible. I'm talking about what Jesus did, okay? Yes, he blessed people, but he didn't go around saying, you know, I love you and kissing everybody. He went around and he rebuked people, and he rebuked people sharply, and a lot of times, very harshly. You are a son of Satan, a son of hell, a whitewashed tomb. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dirty, filthy, stinking, rotten bones. A corpse. That's Jesus. So when it comes to interpretation, you got to weigh it out. You got to say, hey, is the song that I'm hearing from this interpretation the same kind of song that I hear throughout all scripture is it the song of repentance the song of righteousness 
the song of redemption, the song that changes people's lives, the song that calls you to change. Remember Jesus said, I come to call sinners to repentance. So when it comes to the gift of tongues, most of it is fake. Sadly, there are some genuine cases out there, and that's awesome. So once again, as you go your way, may the words that I have spoken be food for thought, something to meditate upon, something that God can use to bring real, true first century Christianity to you and to everyone around you.